think you need to need to give me permissions. So there we go. Can everybody see that? That should have gone into slideshow mode. And that's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm off. Um, so hello everybody and welcome to the Wanstead House Antiques Roadshow. Um, I'm working from a script tonight and you'll see why some of the descriptions are very long. So I have to uh, read some of them out. Uh, my name is Tim Cousins and um, for 40 years I've been researching one of the other Tilney Long Wellesley homes at Dracot House, which is in Dracot Cern near Chippenham in Wiltshire. It's just off of Junction 17 of the motorway, the M4. It was demolished much more recently than once did, between 1952 and 54. Despite this, the records have been dispersed far and wide and it's taken time to collect in various records offices, the National Archives at Kew, the British Library and many more. So I only dabble in Wanstead House, but I hope that you find uh, my research on tracing the contents of Wanstead House interesting. So while the talk outline is there, I'll explain that the talk is deliberately a supplement to Hannah Armstrong's book, which was recently published. So I'll only show two slides that are in her book. Um, for reasons which I'll explain. And I'll show um, different slides on the Chatsworth and Wilton collections. For each piece, I'll give the descriptions from the Robbins catalogue um, and a brief modern version that is either the most up-to-date information on the catalogue entry from the last sales, which are in the last 20 years. For the pieces of furniture in private collections, there'll be an opportunity to guess the price at auction with the answers given before we move on to the pictures. So a disclaimer, um, please, for copyright purposes, don't record the um, presentation. It's being recorded by uh, Wanstead Parklands. That's fine um, for people that um, can't make it um, on this particular occasion. They can see it later on and uh, Richard will put the link out. Um, please don't take photos or mobiles or use the snipping tool on your screens. And a further disclaimer, so I'm a geophysicist. I'm not an art historian or a furniture expert. So anything that's presented here comes from a long period of discussion and learning from experts rather than any professional qualifications of my own. Um, the experts are in the acknowledgements at the end of the talk. <laughs> So um, I have my own uh, full set of photos of the 1795 Wanstead House inventory that was done on the death of Sir James Tilney Long. Um, and that's at the National Archives and you can see it on the left hand side. I've got a complete transcript of, I don't have a, a complete transcript of this myself yet. I've done um, about half of it and there's been more work done on it by others. Um, you can see that it's labelled Exhibit A down here, um, and that's because it was impounded as part of the Long Wellesley Chancery lawsuits in the late 1820s, and that's what's preserved it in the National Archives at Kew. On the right-hand side is the much more familiar Robbins catalogue of 1822. Um, I've got hard copies of the Redbridge version and two digital versions from the Newham copy. That's important um, because they've got purchases marked and there are some differences between the annotations, uh, which makes things easier to trace. The comparison between 1795 and the 1822 catalogues shows which furniture was original to the house or added in the mid 18th century and the pieces purchased by William and Catherine Long Wellesley after 1812. The 1795 total value of the effects exclusive of the hangings 
was £3,510. That's, that's written on the next page after this introduction. Uh, William and Catherine uh, hoped to receive £25,000 from the sale of the materials and the furniture towards a £30,000 settlement of their debts. So even if we allow £10,000 for the building materials, in fact, that the, the actual Robin's receipt was much less than expected, it's clear that William Long Wellesley had spent a huge amount of furniture. The majority had been in the house for less than 10 years at the time of the Robin's sale. Of course, furniture also moved around the house during the renovations of 1812 to 13, and some of the um, room descriptions also changed, which makes tracing the furniture more difficult. So this is familiar, it's the Wanstead assembly by Hogarth showing the interior of the ballroom, and it's in Hannah's book, and there are only three reasons for showing it now. Uh, firstly, to show the Battle of Granicus tapestry, that's here on the left-hand side of the chimney piece. Second, to beg for any information about the silver table um, that's next to Earl Tilney. It's never been traced. It wasn't in the 1795 inventory, so it may have been sold by then. And the third reason is to agree completely with Hannah um, that far from overestimating and even satirizing the interiors of Wanstead, Hogarth actually underestimated the later opulence of the house. This is the Nolikens uh, family portrait of the saloon. It's early, about 1740, and therefore may not have every piece of furniture, e.g. the commode, which is um, coming later in the talk, or all of the sculptures in situ. Um, you can see that the niches here are empty. They were later, later filled with sculptures. It was uh, the chairs that uh, alerted John Martin Robinson and Peter Brown of Fairfax House to the furniture at Wilden House. Uh, my own research on this particular picture has shown that it was in the collection of Lady Victoria Long Wellesley, that's Catherine's daughter, until her death in 1897. So now we're moving on to the Wilton collection. And these um, are scans from the Wilton House guidebook. You can clearly see the early, um, probably Kent chair in the colonnade room, that's here. And it was um, on the left, that's exactly as shown in the Nolikens, uh, with the angled top corners. Unfortunately, the ballroom sofa is hidden um, behind one of the columns. The chaise long and the footstool are possibles from Wanstead. That's this piece in the center here, um, of which there were many described in the Robbins catalog. If they're right, they're part of the gilt furniture that was purchased by uh, William Long Wellesley after 1812. The picture on the right-hand side, by contrast, is one of the two Kent chairs, and it's in the double cube room at Wilton. Um, in backup, I've added um, a pair of the Kent console tables that are in the ante room at Wilton House. And we'll come on to those if we have time at the end of the talk. Unfortunately, there's so many uh, console tables uh, in the Robbins catalog that tracing them is quite difficult. What are you doing? You are very, very bad. Very, very bad. Okay, moving on. Uh, now it's on to the Chatsworth collection. The Kent uh, original table from the Grand Hall at Wanstead is shown on the left-hand side. Robbins described it as a magnificent square library table, top lined with costly Russia leather and broad stamped border, a brass molded edge with rich chased ormolu shells in the corners on a superb oak frame, sumptuously carved and gilt with Grecian scroll panels, trust supports on solid square molded edge plinths and casters with Neptune heads ornaments in the center supported on each side by elegant large scroll wings. This, uh, it's a very, very large piece of furniture. It's nine feet long by six feet wide. Um, and it was 92 pounds and eight shillings to Ridgeway. That's the agent um, for the Duke of Devonshire. And it's now in the sculpture gallery with a new top with the volumey chandeliers and a pair of ormolu 
mounted urns, which were um, pictured in Hannah's book. The picture on the right hand side is the second of the sculptures from the Grand Hall, now in the north entrance of Chatsworth. That's an antique statue of Domitian, in inverted commas, seven feet high, a first rate excellence and beauty upon a stone pedestal, also 84 pounds to Ridgeway. You can just about see the statue of Agrippina that's here in the background. They're usually described as Herculaneum, um, but in fact, they were purchased from the Hubert um, collection in Cox's cell rooms in London by um, Viscount Castlemaine in 1735. They're Gallic Roman and they're from a necropolis at Ike's on Provence in France. They're actually uh, nothing to do with either Domitian, um, which is an, an unknown Roman god, or Agrippina. And as an aside, um, John Earl Tilney did actually visit the excavations at Herculaneum while he was in Italy and describes them in the letters that I've transcribed and they'll be published shortly. There are two, these are two of the seven purchases by the sixth Duke of Devonshire at the Robin's sale. The console table in the private dining room, the Ormolu mounted alabaster vases and statue of Apollo are in back. So again, if we've got time, um, we can um, have a look at those later. This is one of the Kent pier tables, also from the Grand Hall. Um, although sold recently, it's in this section to note the shell motifs and the similar carving, matching the much larger centre table now at Chatsworth. The spread eagles are from the Tilney crest. And it's a pity um, that they weren't reunited. Um, I don't know why the Duke of Devonshire um, decided to pass on those. Um, Robbins described them as costly veined marble pier table on richly gilt uh, massive carved frame supported by splendid spread eagles with lion's head and shell ornaments in the center decorated with festoons. One uh, resurfaced at Ronald Phillips, a leading London antiques firm in 2021. The catalogue, while excellent, um, confused the Grand Hall with the saloon and used the Nolikins as an uh, illustration. No realized price is available. Now moving on to the Royal Collection. Um, given George IV's tendency to overspend, it's quite a surprise to find that only, uh, he only instructed his agents to make one purchase at the Wanstead House sale. This was the silver gilt mounted Nautilus cup shown on the left hand side. Robin's description, a splendid and matchless antique Nautilus shell table ornament superbly mounted in silver richly gilt, chased and embossed, with a beautiful ornamental cover and figure of Jove on his eagle in the center, holding the insignia of war and peace, supported by a most delicate chased figure of Neptune on a seahorse with tridents. That went for 120 pounds to Bridge. Um, that was the um, agent uh, for George IV at the time. And the present Royal Collections description is circa 1600, it's by Nicholas Schmidt of Nuremberg. It was made, uh, his, his dates are 1550 to 55 to 1609. And it's a spectacular Kunstkammer object, one of the finest examples of antiquarian plate acquired by George IV. And it's now at Windsor Castle and it's in the glass cases. So as you go out of St. George's Hall, it's just before the uh, restored chapel. On the right hand side is one of the silver gilt shell salts from the Royal Collection, part of the great service. Although it's not from Wanstead, it's exactly the same as the six Rundle Bridge and Rundle salts purchased after 1812 by William Long Wellesley. The Robin's description, a pair of shell, uh, costly shell salts and gilt inside linings supported on tritons in beautifully matted silver and lots 307 and 38, a pair of the same. They went for nine pounds uh, per ounce per pair, 30 pounds shillings to Valence, um, and they haven't been traced. Now it's back to the saloon, and I have to explain um, the word type in the title. 
This commode is from the Metropolitan Museum of New York, and it ex almost exactly matches the Robin's description. The superb antique Parisian ball and tortoiseshell commode with two drawers and beautifully bared antique top in brass molded frame on scroll French legs with costly massive chased and gilt winged angel figures, which went for 40 pounds to Jarman. But the key word here is almost. The marble top on many pieces from Wanstead have often been replaced, but when tracing furniture, every part of the description needs to be checked and any dimensions. In this case, the lack of a brass molded frame means that it cannot have come from Wanstead, but you get some idea of just how extraordinary the Wanstead furniture was. Orlando Rock of Christie's described it as the um, a commode en tombeau um, of the same model as the celebrated pair supplied in 1708 for the bedchamber of Louis XIV at Versailles. It was not in the 1795 saloon inventory, so was purchased by William Long Wellesley in France. Now we're on to the furniture traced to private collections, starting with the best. Uh, the Riachi collection center table from the grand floor, drawing room, ante room adjacent. It wasn't even in one of the state rooms. Described by Robbins as a magnificent square antique marquetry tortoiseshell and bull console table, top beautifully finished with flowers, birds and butterflies, brass molded edge drawer to the frame and tablets in the center of lapis lazuli, ormolu frames, Grecian scroll legs and ormolu female figure ornaments went for 40 pounds, 19 shillings. And unfortunately in the catalog, the buyer is illegible. So that makes it difficult until it uh, resurfaced um, to trace um, for up until 2001. Uh, it was known in Paris until 1779 and Christie's thought it was purchased by the second Earl Tilney. And because it's um, not in the 1795 inventory, it's much more likely to be another of William Long Wellesley's purchases. When it passed through Christie's auction house in New York in 2001, it was described as a Louis XIV former Lou, ebony blue stained corn brass pewter tortoiseshell bull and marquetry center table circa 1685. So it was um, directly attributed to Andre Charles Bull. And he was one of the most important French furniture makers primarily uh, working for the French royal family and other aristocratic um, patrons. And he gave his name to a particular type of in inlay. Um, in the same um, Riachi auction was another uh, Wallstead gear table that's in the bottom center here from the ballroom. And that's um, one of a pair. And I'll cut through the um, Robin's description to save some time at this point. It's um, an ormolu rail shell und sh shelf under with ormolu tripod frame vase in the center, elegantly mounted with rich chase moldings. That went for 27 pounds at 10 shillings to Jarman. And Christie's noted another pair in the Wildenstein collection. And there's a similar pair in the Wallace, Wallace collection in London. So this is your first opportunity to guess the prices of those two items. The largest collection of furniture from Wanstead wasn't for either Chatsworth or Wilton, um, but for a newly rebuilt house near Bristol. It was called Lee Court. The purchaser was Philip Miles. Um, he was from a Wiltshire family and he may therefore have known the Long Wellesleys, but there's no proof of this. This interior picture of the Lee Court drawing room is by Thomas Rowbottom and it's held by Bristol Museum and Art Gallery and you can also get it on Wikipedia. Lee Court is not open to the public um, but can be hired for events and weddings. Um, the rooms are mostly stripped bare except for the window surrounds. The definite uh, Wanstead items are a Berger chair, that's here with the pole screen next door, um, the drawing room chairs, um, which are in another room, 
uh, the curtains and the gilt frames and the possible purchases of the tour shares here on either side of the window and the side tables. This picture is as near as we can get to how Wanstead looked after William and Catherine Long Wellesley's renovations after 1812, which is why I used it as the publicity um, for this tour. It conforms to the description of Wanstead as a uniform glow of burnished gold. And this is what uh, Wicked William called only what was necessary and unavoidable. Top right, and we've got an Edwardian photo of the Kent Revival Berger chair from Wanstead Ballroom. This will have been one of Long Wellesley's additions, Robin's description, an elegant carved and gilt mounted frame wo woven chair with Grecian scroll back and elbows covered in costly crimson damask. 52 pounds, 10 shillings the pair to miles. In the bottom, we've got the detail of the Kent original 12 grand drawing room chairs with needlework backs reputedly by the Countess of Plymouth, who was a relative of the family. Robbins described them as splendid, massive carved and gilt frame elbow chairs on French feet with square seats and backs stuffed and covered in beautiful Persia pattern silk needlework. 26 pounds, five shillings the pair to Miles, who only purchased eight. And Christie's just called them George the First, first gilt gesso armchairs um, when they were sold in 2005. Guess the price of a similar pair. In the top left is the Grand Hall of Lee Court, um, circa 1915. And that's showing the set of four urns out of 14 from the Grand Hall of Wanstead House. There's some confusion um, between the two makers, Delvo and Skaymarkers, um, as to who made which urn, which we haven't got time to deal with now. Um, described by Robbins as a she maker, um, a very splendid Medician shaped vase, four foot six inches high, of statuary marble, etc. And a ditto with the subject of the sacrifice of Iphigenia on a stone pedestal, same as the last. And the last one, a Bacchanalian subject of equal beauty and excellent with the two last, and they went for 84 pounds each two miles. Two of them were in the Sculpture in Britain galleries in the V&A um, until recently, but now they're on loan uh, to the National Court uh, Trust at Prune Court near Worcester, and they'll be going on display soon. So you can go and look at them there. The next, um, two items are part of the set that passed by marriage from Miles to the Bing family of Roton Park in Hertfordshire. They were sold by Christie's in 2005. The very fine antique colossal bust of Lucius Verus, as, uh, as Robbins described it. Christie's attributed it to Delvaux and the same as some of the urns. It's been sold on quite a few times with the attribution changing. Um, but it was back to Delvaux and it was last seen in 2017. On the right hand side, you've got the bull gilt candelabras from the Wanstead dining room, um, which were described as magnificent Ornamalu candelabra with massive uh, ram's head scroll branches. They went for £42 and £48 to Garrard's, the jewellers. They're not part of the 1795 inventory, so they were probably purchased by William Long Wellesley in France. Christie's described them as um, a pair of Louis XIV Ormolu four light candelabra, 1710, and again, directly attributed them to André Charles Boulle. Roten Park is still owned by the Bing family. It's not open to the public, but can be hired for events and weddings, but unfortunately, all of the ones to pieces have now gone. Guess the prices of those two items. We'll skip these um, for time. Um, they're the last two pieces from Miles and Bing, and they are um, both Regency copies. The other Kent furniture 
in private collections, the pier glass on the left-hand side passed through Christie's in 2008. That's the only Wanstead mirror of many um, traced so far. It's one of a pair from the grand dining room. Uh, we'll skip over the um, Robbins catalog and description. It's too long. Um, it went for £17.16 to bins um, and wasn't traced until recently. And it was one of the pieces described by Peter Brown, who was then of Fairfax House, who thought it in the manner of uh, Matthias Locke, mid 18th century. We don't actually know um, who made it and, and when it came into Wanstead House exactly. Top right is the gilt pier tables with red sienna marble tops from the Christie's Patridge sale of 2006, uh, George II gilt wood side tables. They're almost certainly um, by William Kent himself, circa 1735. They had been separated and they were brought together again for that Christie's stool. And then on the left hand side on the bottom is one of a set of five gilt stools from the saloon. Um, the uh, Christie's um, thought that they were actually um, later, um, but they're actually in the 1795 inventory, um, four stools on carved and gilt frames covered with crimson silk damask in the saloon. And there was one larger than the others and a further set of five in the ante room uh, next door. So they are completely authentic. The other re Regency items that have tra been traced by our auction houses, um, this is one of a pair. Um, it's one of the, from the green damask sitting room. Um, and it's an elegant two feet circular oriental Japan rotary ladies bookcase and work table divided into compartments by handsome tablets, top lined with crimson silk, velvet and octagon work bag. Those went for two, uh, 24 pounds to Monteith. Uh, that's a Regency piece about 1810. The maker is unknown uh, with imported lacquer panels of an earlier date. This is the version that passed through Sotheby's in 2012, um, which most closely matches uh, the Robbins description. Guess the price of this item. <clears throat> Other silver. Um, no hallmarks are noted in the Robbins catalog. Um, that makes proving one's to provenance very difficult. Uh, the weights are given and a few of the descriptions are detailed enough to be certain. The silver is also grouped together from the plate store, so we don't know where the candlesticks were used, but it's almost certainly the grand dining room. These include a pair of beautiful openwork Chinese pattern pillar candlesticks um, with supported by Mandarin figures. They were sold from the Whiteley Trust silver collection by Christie's in 2000, and they were made by Phillips Garden in 1754 to 56. On the right, you've got the famous pair of Wanstead silver gilt dishes by Paul Store for Rundles. And like the salts, another set was made for George IV and now forms another part of the great service that's on display at state banquets. I'll skip the uh, Robbins description uh, for time. Um, there was a, a, um, a second one with um, Apollo's lyre, pan pipes, tambourine, cymbals, and other musical instruments. And a third one with a scene of the Feast of Gods with dolphin ornaments around that had been in the Werner collection sold through Christie's in 2000. So now we have a pause um, because the answers are coming. So these are the um, prices that were realized. Um, and they're the latest. So through, through time, as they go through the auction houses, the prices go up. The Riaki Center table was 3.9 million. That's a world record price for a piece of French furniture by Bull. The pier table was 1.1 million. And the whole Riaki uh, collection sold for $40 million. And that's the highest total for a single owner sale of the French furniture. Uh, the, the armchairs, 
um, with a pre-sale estimate of 250,000 to 400,000 a pair. The bust of Lucius Verus was 142,400. The bull candelabras were 153,600. The pole screen and mirror, 2,640. The card table, 18,000. The mirror was 109,250. The pair of Kent side tables, $576,000. The giltwood stool was $92,500. The circular bookcase with the lacquer panels, 63,650. The silver candlesticks were 179,740. And the Paul Store dish had a pre sale estimate of between 150 and $250,000. Now, I've realized that um, we're way over time. Um, this was uh, supposed to uh, stop at 10 past eight. So I'm going to go very quickly through the pictures. Uh, one of the great benefits of tracing pictures from the Wanstead House to public institutions is the Art UK website. That makes pictures and gallery descriptions and provenance information easily available and searchable. And unlike the Robbins catalog, um, where pictures have been removed from the walls, the 1795 inventory lists the important ones in situ. With few exceptions, the prices given at the Wanstead sale were moderate, um, which points to copies rather than originals. But that's not how what Robbins described them. The largest set of art at Wanstead was by Nolikins, then the copies by Kent, which follow, Let's start with the rest of the history pictures by Casali. This is Angelica and Medora um, from above the chimney in the green damask velvet room, uh, which had been the flowered velvet room in 1795 and may have been redecorated. It passed through Christie's New York in 1995, but the current location is unknown. These are the other two traced uh, Casali um, history pictures. On the left-hand side is Alexander presenting his mistress Campaspe to Apelles. On the right-hand side is one of the uh, continents of Scipio, another Roman subject, um, which led to the um, quote from um, Horace Walpole about the continences and incontinences of Scipio. He obviously didn't think much of Casali as a painter. Uh, the last of those went to an agent of uh, Fainswick and Martin of Leeds Castle, and they were there until the 1930s. Um, it's now in uh, Runcorn Town Hall, of all places, with another by Casali from the Wanstead dining room. So they were always designed to be shown together. The other traced Casali is now in the entrance hall at Burton Constable House in Yorkshire. And that's the Coriolanian, uh, Coriolanus history picture that's in Hannah's book. The next um, most prolific artist was Bogdani. Um, he was an Hungarian artist working in England. Um, these may have been purchased by First Earl Tilney, um, but given the Second Earl uh, Tilney's interest in exotic birds, to the extent of building the temple for them, um, they may have been later purchases. There's no direct proof of either of these um, from the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge of Wanstead provenance, but they match the Robbins descriptions reasonably well. Now it's on to the copies. The most likely painter of which was William Kent uh, from his grand tour of Italy. On the left-hand side is Cardinal Bentivoglio, um, which is confidently attrib attributed to Van Dyck by Robbins which went for 33 pounds, 12 shillings to Hugh Duncan Bailey. Now the trouble is that the original is in the Pitti Palace in Florence and has always been in Italy. Um, there was a second version in Ireland, but none have been traced so far. It was in the billiard room, which was one of the private apartments on the ground floor. On the right, you've got the um, so-called four philosophers, Again, no 18th century copies are known so far. It was in the dining room hung with leather, 
another of the private apartments on the ground floor. It wasn't just um, oil copies at Wanstead. Um, for the left-hand side, Robbins described Edel Sarto, um, who's an Italian Renaissance artist, the Holy Family, a beautiful pen wash drawing heightened with white. Um, even as a drawing, it went for three pounds to Peacock. So was this an original preparatory sketch or Kent's copy drawing while he was in Italy from the original? We don't know at the moment. On the right hand side, we've got uh, what um, Robbins referred to as Titian uh, La Baigneuse, a beautifully copy after. So uh, he was fairly straight on this lot. There were another three supposed Titians at Wanstead and no Titians have the title Baigneuse. The most likely original is the Venus and Argeomia Omni, uh, rising from the sea. And that's in the National Gallery of Scotland. In the 1795 inventory, um, this may be the lady dressing herself uh, from the dining room hung with leather, but a bedroom or a dressing room would be much more likely. Lastly, uh, one slide on the Wanstead tapestries. <clears throat> we, know from, um, we know that my Lord Castlemaine purchased the Battle of Granicus um, with uh, the others in the set from the Lanier's factory in Brussels. Um, the work was completed between 1724 and 1728 and was shown in situ in the Wanstead Ballroom on the Hogarth. The others from the originals by Le Brun were the entry of Alexander to Babylon and the family of Darius. The problem with tapestries is that the factories produced multiple sets in multiple sizes of the same patterns and cartoons were used for other factories. So the picture here is from Vienna. Um, it's got no known Wanstead provenance is from a, and is from a slightly different set. Robbins was very enthousi enthusiastic about it, um, but I'll leave his description um, for the time. We're running over slightly now. Um, below is one of a set of uh, eight Gobelin tapestries after cartoons by Eckhout, and they're called the Nouvelle Und. Um, given the interest in, of the child family in the East India Company, it makes sense for them to have a set of tapestries on this theme. And unfortunately, the only Robbins description is a superb panel of tapestry in high preservation, representing an assemblage of birds, etc., 15 feet by uh, 13 feet. And the only picture that I have to illustrate them is different. That's a tapir being attacked by a tiger but experts assure, assure me that they are from the same set and the others have not been uh, traced. So conclusions. Um, the furniture collection at Wanstead was world-class. It included the largest collection of original Kent furniture in the UK, supplemented by some of the most important pieces by André Charles Hall. The silver table from the ballroom remains untraced to date. Uh, the prices realised for the Riathi Bull table means that furniture with any potential ones to problems will be promoted. Many furniture lots can be expected and traced in the future and not all of them will have a robust ones to provenance. That comes back to those details of the measurements and the difference between type and exact. The early 19th century gilt furniture editions by William Long Wellesley's are mostly but not always distinguishable from the originals. There's some Kent style which pieces which remain problematic. The huge quantities of silver ordered by Rundle Bridge and Rundle made by Paul Storr was one of the major contributors to William Long Wellesley's debt. And the Wanstead art collection was always of lesser importance than the other contents, but still beautiful and decorative. Many were copies from the start by Kent probably, um, these were not augmented by many originals by, from Italy. There were some from John, the second Earl Tilney, the exceptions being the Bogdani bird pictures and many scenes of classical ruins by Panini. So there was about 12 of those. No picture purchases have been identified by William Long Wellesley after 1812, but there must be some. So I'll leave the acknowledgements up. 
Um, you can read those. Um, we're now just two minutes over and it's time for opening up to questions and answers. Well, hopefully it answers. Did anybody get all of the prices right? Did anybody get any of the prices right? <clears throat> Georgina Green should have got two of the prices right because they were in the Wanstead Guardian two weeks ago. Tim, Tim, I've actually got notes of a lot of this that you sent me 20 years ago, so I wouldn't dream of guessing because I know. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Is there any questions in we, the chat? Um, yes, we have a, a question from Andrew Shields. What proportion of the overall sale contents have been traced? Oh, that's a very good question. Less than 5%. Question from David Rodwell. Uh, can we tell, tell us something about Rahi, the collection? Who is this guy? Uh, he's... French Iranian, um, and that's that's all I know about him. I would imagine being Iranian, there were there was some oil money, and he probably left in a hurry in 1979. But I don't know any more than that he's French Iranian. Thank you very much. <clears throat> As a follow up from Andrew Shields, does the quality reference? indicate great taste and discernment or was it a case of loads of money will buy anything or everything uh no it's it's the furniture um is is world class and is is extremely good furniture both the original uh, the original kent furniture is fantastic the best that you could get and the Purchases that, that William Long Wellesley made in Paris after, after his uh, marriage are unbelievably good as well. Um, it, it's the pictures which, which slightly let the side down. That there is, there is an element of, of the, the money having run out and, and some wall fillers being required from, from Kent. That's all we've got at the moment. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, when we went oh, to... Oh, we, yes, we've, 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 we've got a couple more. <laughs> Victoria, is the, Fairfax, is the Fairfax House collection what Wonsford House might have looked like had it not been scattered? Yes. The... the um, it, it, it's very... It's very interesting, actually. Um, the the Nolikins is, I, is, it's either in the dining room or the drawing room at Fairfax House, and and the Fairfax House is is absolutely gorgeous. It's it's got the most amazing collection of, of Georgian furniture. Um, very very similar to to how parts of it would have would have looked. Not not every room and not quite as golden as, as William Long Wellesley had made it. Um, so so um, it doesn't look exactly like the interiors of Wanstead. The, the picture, as I said, the picture from, from Bristol is, is the closest that you can get. But as, as you walk around Fairfax House, when you go to see the, the Nolkins, it's, it's, it's pretty good match. Um, we, ha we have a couple. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, no. Just a question. Um, we went, Christine Rodwell here, when we went to Chatsworth, we were under the impression that the dining table was the table that they'd bought from Wanstead. But in fact, now well, you've told us it's the table in the library, I think it was. Yeah. Um, was there a dining table? And if so, do you have any idea what happened to it? So it um, can you see that? Uh, yes. Is it yep. still sharing? 
yeah. yes so that's that's the it, it's a peer table so they they use it for the drinks it's 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 not the actual dining table but it's in the dining room but it's in the private part that's that's not open to the public ah at chatsworth it's in the at private. chatsworth right yeah. thank you it's in, it, it's in the private dining room uh, was there a dining table do you know uh there was four <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, they haven't been traced. Right. right. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Um, how do we know the silver commissions with the greatest cause of debt is gambling? Uh, that is from Rory Montgomery. I've I've got letters um, from uh, one of William's butlers saying that he was off to uh, sell uh, things back to Paul Store, uh, uh, sorry, to Rundle Bridge and Rundle um, in 1819 or 20. So it, it was it was way before the sales. You, you, you sort of bought these, he, he, he was a silversmith and money lender combined as they often were at that time. So you sort of bought them on, on a higher, purchase arrangement and if you couldn't meet the interest rates you had to hand them back so so they, they were handing things back um to rundle bridge and rundle uh, way before the sales yes. as for gambling if if i could just butt in um william long wellesley himself denied being much of a gambler uh, whether yep. or not that's true um, certain other very large sources of expenditure can be identified, and yeah. uh, such notably his political career um, yeah. and the uh, refurbishment of Wandsmith, of course, and uh, filling it up with all this very expensive stuff. But in recent years, uh, some of his bank records have come to light. I haven't studied them, but other people have. And uh, no doubt this will all become clearer. Yeah. So I can't remember how many, I'm just showing you the um, card table here that he bought in um, about 1813, something like that. Um, there, there was six, six or eight of those th throughout the house. So, so clearly there was some gambling that was going on, but that, that wasn't, that, that's one of the few times when when uh, he, his denial um, that it was gambling debts uh, that got him into trouble was actually correct. And, and the amount that he spent on elections was enormous. 60,000 on one occasion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which can be multiplied by 120 to give you some idea of the yeah, present bit. day. Oh, I don't know. Right, uh, another question. On a visit to Henry Raines Hurst House, I was told that some of Wanstead House ended up there, e.g. a fireplace. Uh, that's not one that I know. Um, so um, get, it, get in contact um, with uh, John and Richard um, and we'll, we'll follow that up. How did you do that? No idea. I, I, I don't know those fireplaces. Um, there are a couple at Chillingham Castle as well, I believe. Uh, there used to be. Um, whether they're still there or not, um, I think they're boarded up. Um, that there's some fire surrounds at a house um, in, in Cambridge. A lot of the um, building stone went, went to Cambridge. So the biggest collection of those pieces is there. Yes, so that, in, including possibly a staircase and various door surrounds and window yep. surrounds cut, cut down to size. The, the building is helpfully known as Wanstead House because they were very proud of the provenance of their bits and pieces. Yep. And there's a picture in, in Hannah's book. 
Now that's all the questions I've got in chat. Is there anything I, else? I see that Francis uh, Clancy has got his uh, hand up. So Francis, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yes, uh, perhaps a slightly bizarre question, but uh, on the um, many walks and talks I've done uh, over the years about Wanstead House, I was once told that um, the wicked William sold the topsoil on Wanstead Flats to raise money. Um, do you have any information about that? Is that true? I've only ever heard it the once and I've never heard it verified since then. Uh, the, no. the, the topsoil was a very peculiar thing because um, the whole of the park came under forest law. So you had to ask permission from the warden to remove it. And I know of letters um, to Earl Tilney asking for some to be removed. And I know some for Sir James Tilney Long to be used. And I know of other people pinching some and being prosecuted for it. But I don't know of that same process for William Long Wellesley, but it wouldn't surprise me. Okay. I've, I've, heard, I've heard the story and I have repeated it, um, but I, I can't, I can't, um, I can't refer to a source. Thank you, thank you for that. Peter Williams says the topsoil sales on flats were later, I believe, and I have some documentation. So mm -hmm. there we have it. Yeah, there's a there's that I found something. I'd have to dig it out. I I think it's from the mid sort of 1830s. I think. Yeah, that was when the trees went in the park, the 1820s <laughs> and 1830s. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the brick earth deposits on the flats were also exploited in the I think 1840s or 1850s leaving the large rectangle. 18, 1867 was the lease. The it, was, it was a 17-year le lease from um, the 1860 through to 1881. Oh, okay, right, fair enough. Because Mark um, Mark Gorman found that lease in the Essex record. Office. That's Peter speaking, is it? Yeah, it is, yes. Sorry. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah that, that lease survives in the Essex record office. Well, that's good to know. Okay, are there... There's still six in the chat, I think. Oh, no. No, that's... No, I think they're all, the they're all done. They're all done. Okay. Well, if that's all the questions... Um, I'd like to say, well, thank you. Thanks so much, Tim, for such a fascinating, uh, illuminating uh, discussion, well, presentation. Um, it doesn't take a great deal to um, enhance my knowledge of wanted house furniture, but I'm sure for the experts out there, there are things that you've told us that um, we certainly didn't know. So thank you for all the work that you've put in and for getting in touch with us and making yourself available to do this. Uh, I'm sure it's been much appreciated by everybody. No problem. So okay. um, but there is there is more. So um, if anybody wants a second run um, with, with the other items. I think okay. the last thing I think the last thing was a mice and um, tobacco holder. Um, so again, there's some there's some letters with with Earl Tilney. It doesn't say I've just been to the Meissen factory to buy a piece of porcelain, um, but he was in the right place at the right time to buy it. And it's got a picture of Wall's house on the inside of the lid. So, <laughs> yeah. and if anybody's got oh, twenty five thousand pounds, yes. um, they can they can go and buy it. There are pictures of it floating around. I think I saw it. When it it came up at auction or an example that came up at auction. Yeah. 
I checked Christie's just before we started and there's there's nothing on there um, today. Okay, Tim. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks again for <clears throat> running with this and uh, certainly <clears throat> get back in touch with us with regard to any second presentation that you might be able to make. Um, we all appreciate it. And on that note, thank you.